All right, guys, we're back. And what an interesting time uh, in history we're studying today. Uh, this is in the midst of the progressive era, and it, it comes on the heels of the Gilded Age when so much progress was being created. Uh, this would have been just a fascinating time to be alive. So we're going to jump into it now and talk about what the muckrakers are. First of all, we have to recognize that rapid, rapid urbanization, big business growth, industrial growth, it represents incredible progress, but it also creates some social problems, right? Um, we, there were incredibly good things for our government, for our economy, for our people, uh, for jobs. But with all of that rapid growth, we took a look back and we realized oh, there may have been some, some problems, right? Some unintended side effects uh, that, that were created by that. So now in this era of the progressive age, right, it's time to clean those up. And muckrakers play a really, really important role in that. Uh, first of all, social change is never going to happen. I've said this in multiple videos, never going to happen without two things. One, you have to have awareness. People need to be aware of the problem before you can find a solution to the problem, right? And that's really where the muckrakers come in. It's about bringing awareness. So what we'll see is that the muckrakers, if we were to define them, right, it's they're journalists. They're journalists who shine a light on the issues that were ignored by society. They're crusaders for reform. I love these guys. They're like a dog with a bone, right? They're going to grab hold of an issue and they are not going to let it go. Now, sometimes they'll advocate for two or three or four different issues anytime they see something that they want to, to see rectified by society. But most of the time, uh, they kind of see one thing that just that, that gets them right where they live, right? Breaks their heart to see it. And they are a crusader for that one major issue. So uh, I want to introduce you to a handful of the more notable muckrakers. There were lots of them. This is just a sampling of muckrakers, these journalists, these crusaders. So first and foremost, we're going to take a look at Jacob Rees. He is an early photographer and writer. And, uh, and I love this because he's going to use his camera lens to affect change. He's going to bring to light really the, the, not the working conditions, but the living conditions, right? The living conditions of the lower class, specifically the tenement houses. Now, I'm fascinated by tenement houses. I'm fascinated by the way people live their lives and what they had to endure and overcome. But it's Jacob Reese that really brings that to all of our attention. And so uh, I'll zoom in here on this is one of his more famous photographs uh, of, of a number of guys kind of sharing uh, one house. There are two, four, six guys in this image. Uh, and so you just see photograph after photograph after photograph of how the other half lives, of, of how the, the lower half lives. And so he publishes a book where he writes his accounts and, and publishes his pictures. Uh, the book is literally called How the Other Half Lives. And it wasn't how the other half lives. It really was a greater percentage than half. Uh, many, many people had to live in these squalid conditions. And if you watched the Tenement House video, you kind of understand what that's like. And I would encourage you to do that if you haven't. But, uh, but it kind of wakes people up to the need for change. How do we improve society? Well, let's not treat people like animals. So let's not force them to live in these terrible conditions. And so you start to see code uh, building codes, right? To make buildings safer and more livable. You start to see more sanitation. All of that kind of stuff is aimed at these tenement houses. And much of it is because all of a sudden we have an awareness. If you walk past a tenement house in New York City, you see a brick facade uh, with retail on the first floor and a number of floors of apartments. But seeing the facade wouldn't indicate that there was anything wrong seeing the pictures of, of what life is like on the inside, right? Middle and upper class people could walk past those buildings and have no idea of the horrors that are inside. But now they're brought face to face with that reality. Another guy that I absolutely love, and this is Lewis Hine. Again, I'm a very visual thinker. So the ones that, uh, that are kind of using their, uh, their camera lens really speak to me a lot. But this is an author and, and a photographer who exposes child labor. And uh, again, we're taking a look here. These are miners, right? These are our children who are working in mines. Now look at how young they are. And, uh, and so by bringing this, 
uh, to the forefront, right? By by showing these photographs to again, many times the the middle and upper class who maybe don't understand what it takes to get coal into their homes, that don't understand that children are working in those conditions, especially our our lovely empathetic women, right? Uh, they're looking at this, going, their children are getting an education, uh, they're being raised. Uh, with some luxury. And yet these children are going to work in a mine for 10 hours a day. Uh, and it kind of is a heartbreaking thing, right? Uh, so we're brought face to face with those realities. His photographs lead to a push for the end of child labor. And so uh, once people are made aware, then this becomes one of those issues that not everybody, but some people will really latch on to and kind of fight for as well. So he was kind of the, the tip of the spear when it comes to bringing awareness and pushing for the end of child labor. This, uh, this one here is a child labor in a textile mill. And this one, she's in a factory, not even wearing shoes. Um, these kids are, are terribly mistreated. Oftentimes they lack any opportunity to get an education and without education, how will they ever rise above this type of life? Now, the next one that we're going to look at is Upton Sinclair, and this is fascinating and gross and disturbing and, and all kinds of wonderful, right? So Upton Sinclair writes The Jungle, and he writes The Jungle in an effort to really push a socialist agenda. He's pro-socialism. He's pro-union. Uh, and, and he really writes this about an immigrant family and their struggles uh, and how it's really impossible for them to rise above the lowest station in life. Um, the problem is that he writes the descriptions of their life so well, it's those descriptions that get remembered. And one of the things that he writes about is the workplace of kind of one of the protagonists. Um, one of the characters in his book works at a meatpacking industry. And his portrayal of the meatpacking industry is so disturbing that uh, it turns people's stomach. Uh, people are reading these accounts and getting physically ill. Uh, it's fantastic. You should absolutely read it, right? Uh, because people are eating meat that comes from these factories, and some of it's diseased, and there are uh, rodents and, and mice and rats. There are maggots. They are taking rancid meat, and they're mixing it in with the good meat in order to resell it. Uh, there's all sorts of, there's an industrial accident, right? So there could be, I don't know, pieces of people in there and blood if somebody gets a, a cut or a nick on their hand and it's it's oh, it's just gross, right? But it leads Teddy Roosevelt, who was president at the time of this publishing, he reads it uh, and he decides to make a, a kind of impromptu surprise inspection. He's, imagine Teddy Roosevelt ate his share of red meat, right? And so uh, he goes and does a surprise inspection on one of these meatpacking plants and discovers that it is indeed as terrible as it's written about. And so it leads him to push Congress to pass two new pieces of legislation. One is called the Meat Inspection Act. These facilities are going to be more highly regulated to make sure that uh, where our food comes from is safe and clean and that the food is uh, is is good, right? That, that we're not being sold stuff that's going to poison us or make us sick. The other one is called the Pure Food and Drug Act. And uh, these are the, the kind of predecessors of the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA, right? So, uh, sorry, that is the FDA, uh, but it's the predecessor of that. And, uh, and so we can trust that the food or the medicines that we buy, if they're FDA approved, uh, are going to do what they say they're going to do, and they're not going to harm us. Um, this is a really big step forward, and it really improves the lives of many people in ways that they can't even begin to fathom. Uh, but we're starting to clean up things like the meatpacking plant. And it's all because it was brought to light, right? Without us knowing, we never would have known it was needed. Now, another guy here is Lincoln Steffens. And Lincoln Steffens exposes political corruption. He writes this book called The Shame of Cities. And it's a lot about the, the machine bosses, the political corruption, the stolen elections, uh, the lack of sanitation, he, he delves into things like the tenement houses uh, and, and so forth as well. Uh, but he really just kind of writes about all the, the, the dire situations in our urban areas. Uh, later, he becomes the editor of a magazine called McClure's. And McClure's is a very important magazine because it's one of the major outlets that will publish works by muckrakers. If you're a crusader, if you're a 
uh, a, a kind of an investigative journalist and you expose something that you think people need to know about, it's the McClure's magazine that will often uh, be the one that that exposes that, right? That, that is your outlet to the public. I don't know why I have a picture of the jungle there, uh, but McClure's magazine is, is really where it's at. So he becomes a major editor of that, uh, that publication. Now, another here is Ida Tarbell, Ida M. Tarbell. And uh, man, does she do a job, right? She writes a, an expose, right? A big story that appears in McClure's magazine in multiple installments. And uh, it's called The History of Standard Oil. Uh, she writes about the personal character of John D. Rockefeller. And we can see that issue uh, right here, right? Uh, a character sketch by Ida M. Tarbell. So that is McClure's magazine that, uh, that she was published in. Um, and it, it kind of brings the corrupt, unethical, uh, absolutely devastating practices uh, of the monopolies like Standard Oil into the public's attention. So uh, Ida Tarbell, it's the, the McClure's magazine is widely read, and it kind of turns uh, Rockefeller into public enemy number one, right? He's, he's a major villain uh, in, in that time because of her expose. Now, one of the really interesting things is that, uh, and what I love about it is this magazine, you don't see a lot of, of female writers, and the magazine is willing to give them a shot where maybe newspapers, established uh, newspapers and things like that would not uh, to the same degree. You have women who are publishing major works and doing it regularly. And so uh, this is very progressive for what they're publishing, but it's also progressive for who they're publishing. Love McClure's Magazine. Another female writer uh, is Ida B. Wells. And uh, she's notable not only for being female, but for being an African-American female. And she really investigates and brings to light issues uh, that, that the black community, that the African-American community really has to deal with. It's going to be about racism and lynchings, uh, what life is like in the segregated South. She's going to kind of bring some of those things to light. Now, we're not in the, uh, the civil rights era at this point. And in fact, we're far from it. Uh, here in uh, around the turn of the century, but she's laying the groundwork, right? Uh, it's going to take time for those things to come to light, but she's one of the first ones shining light on it. Uh, so a fascinating thing uh, to, to see not only women, but African-Americans being given a shot to publish and, and being widely read and, and really having an impact on society. So these were just a, a handful of the muckrakers and the people that, that really made a difference uh, pushing for positive change, bring to light corruption, uh, shining a light on the forgotten places in society. I love the muckrakers and uh, they are going to fight for that social change. They're going to win that social change. Uh, they were often the ones that kind of started new movements, right? Uh, so anyway, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed learning about the muckrakers. Uh, go ahead and subscribe. I'd love to have you and uh, leave me any comments, right? Who did I forget? Was there anything that I left out? Guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate it, and I'll catch you next time.